Live from Boston, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2015. Brought to you by Red Hat. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. Stu and I are going to wrap up here at Red Hat Summit. We're at the Heinz Convention Center. Uh, a lot going on here. Keynotes, the Cube has been running all day. We got a crowd chat going on at crowdchat.net slash Red Hat Summit. Check out siliconangle.tv. All the videos from the Cube will be up there from here and other you know, zillions of other shows that we've done. Check out wikibon.com for all the research. Siliconangle.com has all the, the news of the day. Lots going on, Stu. Um, lots going on in infrastructure. This is kind of cloud and PaaS week. We saw uh, Pure scored EMC CMO, all kinds of little chatter going on there. Uh, maybe we should talk about that a little bit. It's sort of a tangent from this show, but this really is sort of PaaS and cloud week. We're at Oracle on Monday, Docker Con on Monday and Tuesday, and now Red Hat Summit. The timing is um, not coincidental, right? I mean, the market forces are coming together in a way that uh, really underscores that the time is now for these trends, these technologies, this the compression of the cycle is happening yeah. right in front of us. So, so Dave, you know, we, we've been on the road for almost three months now, and we go to so many of these different shows, and if it, just reflect back for a second, because there's some shows I go to, and it's like, you know, they're talking about like a product or a couple of products. Some, it's kind of an ecosystem. Um, you know, some, it's kind of a vision. You know, this show has a very different vibe. It's my second year here at Red Hat Summit. Um, you know, the atmosphere, it's kind of laid back, you know. It's a, you know, executives show up in you know a nice pair of jeans. You know, they're not wearing button-down suits. You know, they've got the red hat cufflinks, the red shoes, or you know, heck, the MC for the show's got a red hat tattoo. I mean, you know, he talked about commitment. Um, you know, we're going to be interviewing Jim Whitehurst tomorrow. I'm really excited about that. Uh, his, you know, business background, him teasing apart, uh, you know, the the open source ethos and how Red Hat really helps to catalyze the the marketplace. Place. Uh, I've talked about it in our intro today, the network effect that, ne that Red Hat gets by being part of the open source community um, and helping to drive that change is, is immense. As you look about what is you know, relatively a small company, I think you said, what's it valued at 15 billion now? They're, they're targeted to do $2 billion worth of revenue this year. And I mean, a major player in a lot of pieces of infrastructure in this application change. Um, the, the word that I heard out of the analyst uh, uh, session today uh, was that what Red Hat wants is Red Hat wants a seat at the table and a seat at more tables and more strategic as to where they play. So it's not just, you know, a Linux company. And, you know, we've lived through kind of this Linux revolution. Um, so, you know, people at this conference, I mean, this is, you know, ground zero for really the open source revolution. Uh, you know, we, we, we've said so many times that, you know, software is eating the world and open source is eating, you know, a lot of what's happening on software. So your, your first time at the show, Dave, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what, what you've gotten from the vibe so yeah, far. Yeah, but I mean, I'm kind of feeling like I'm late to the game, right? But I've certainly watched the, the Linux progression. I was there in the Unix open system days and the promise <laughs> of Linux was always that it would you know sort of be the the single platform of uh, binary compatibility and that sort of never happened uh, as Paul Cormier was pointing out it became you know stovepipes and then you know the kind of the same thing happened maybe to a lesser extent but s similar in, in Linux and we're hearing oh well this one doesn't work with that one and IBM's got its own and Oracle has its own um, but the the ball is moving in the right direction, you know, and, the, and the direction is clear. It's open. Uh, and it has been, frankly, Stu, for 20 plus years. The interesting thing to me is it's now pushing down into the infrastructure. When you look at what's happening with the software-defined data center, software, what we call software-led infrastructure, seeing open source, I mean, Sun tried this in storage. Sun tried to, to do a judo move on, this, on EMC and said, okay, let's open source storage. That was sort of Jonathan Schwartz's move. Everybody laughed at it, said, oh, that's stupid. You were at EMC at the yeah, time. Yeah. But in fact, Red Hat is attempting to execute on that. And you know, given the state of cloud and, 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 we, and, and open systems and, and, or open source today, 
Looks like Red Hat has a much better opportunity than Sun ever had. Yeah, boy, David, it's funny. You look back at some of the things we were doing. I mean, uh, Solaris containers, uh, you know, were, were, were there at Sun. Um, architecturally, it might not have been the best at the time, but some of the ideas that they had at Sun, you know, we're delivering on today uh, from a lot of environments. Um, I, I have a lot of friends that worked at Sun back in the day, um, and, you know, what they did in storage, what they did in networking, uh, you know, I mean, Java, you know, there's so many things that came out of Sun that have now proliferated, but yeah, as you said, Dave, uh, you know, Red Hat is here, has a play in a lot of environments. Um, they, they built a robust ecosystem, um, but it, it is different. It's a different partnership than uh, so some of the other shows that we go to. You know, we were at EMC World, you're, you're at IBM. Uh, you know, companies that know how to partner uh, and, and execute, but uh, you know, Red Hat isn't necessarily trying to be the, you know, let me pull them all away uh, to, together. It's, it's about co-creation. It's about participation with the users and their partners and everyone else involved um, because they're all contributing to the code and they're all contributing to it. And uh, Dave, I, I tell you, in the keynotes, I'm sometimes a little jaded on these keynotes. Um, I do love some of the messaging they talk about, you know, how we're improving education, how 3D printing can help, you know, create prosthetics. I mean, those are, you know, phenomenal use cases to help make a better planet. So. One would hope and think that Red Hat at this point is pretty much acquisition proof. I mean, it can remain independent at $15 billion market valuation. To me, this industry needs an innovator like Red Hat that's growing at 15 to 20% a year, that's expanding its TAMs, getting into new markets, pushing the old guard. Because essentially, Stu, we have an oligopoly in the enterprise. It's, you know, we know who they are, IBM, Oracle, HP, Intel, Cisco, Microsoft, SAP, EMC, VMware, right, did I miss anybody? I mean, those guys pretty much control the chessboard. Little guys come in, they nip at their heels. When they get, you know, to be a, too much of a pain or they fill a gap, boom, they grab them. I guess, I guess Dell, throw Dell in there. Um, so you need a company like Red Hat that's you, you, it's going to guarantee continued innovation through the community. And the other observation is when you're a, a, a company that's, you know, growing up from a smaller base, you can create a business model that is profitable, that doesn't rely on a perpetual license model, that doesn't rely on you know, an upfront big chunk of cash. Um, you're seeing the shift in some companies now. Uh, Oracle's a good example, shifting from you know, upfront perpetual license to a ratable model. Um, well, that's painful for a lot of these big companies. Red Hat doesn't have that problem, they don't have that baggage, and so they're very comfortable with their margin model, margin model is actually quite high, but they're comfortable with that ability to give it away for free and make money up on, on the back end. Hortonworks has a similar model, but it's you know not profitable yet, it's just early days. It's still intriguing to me that we don't see more of this given all the open source innovation, and I suspect the answer to the question of why don't we see more billion dollar software companies that are pure open source is because the market is very, very fragmented. You know, Linux was the one sort of area that allowed Red Hat to consolidate you know, around that OS and build an ecosystem and a, and a product suite around that. And you know, one would think that big data, Hadoop, is potentially big enough to do that. We'll see with Hortonworks, but even you know, Cloudera, who started all the big data movement, decided to go with a hybrid model, you know, an open core model, because it saw that as a faster path to profits. And I think unquestionably it is a faster path to profits, but the question becomes, the long game. Who wins in the long game? Can a company like Red Hat get to the point where it can be beyond, beyond you know, a couple of billion? Can it get to be 10, 15, 20 billion dollar company and attain that ascent to a point where it can attain that market power of the cartel? Yeah, it's a great question, Dave, and you know, one of the things that helps Red Hat uh, where they're going is the developers, Dave. So, you know, Linux, <laughs> is something that you know most developers are familiar with um, and it, it, it really is the you know talk about skating to the puck it's like the pucks kind of come back into a realm uh, where, where Red Hat plays here uh, the, the challenge is you know how does Red Hat actually monetize all of this so Red Hat's a leader in OpenStack uh, but you know where are we actually going to create mo you know value and, and revenue inside OpenStack is it going to be a distribution model uh, like we saw with with, uh, with, with Linux uh, absolutely Red Hat customers 
customers, uh, you know, if they're expanding into OpenStack, are, are going to look closely at, at what Red Hat's doing. But you know, maybe I just go to you know, I go to Rackspace and I, I start consuming services from them. You know, maybe I go to you know an IBM uh, or, or an HP who have built OpenStack solutions, um, or I, you know, I buy storage solutions that that are leveraging OpenStack. You know, how much money can uh, you know Red Hat actually make there? Uh, and OpenShift, we just had a you know phenomenal conversation with Amadeus there. Uh, obviously, they, they bought into the Linux ethos, uh, they're, they're doing a ton with it, uh, but you know, it, it is a challenging market. Uh, you know, I think Derek Collison really you know, laid out you know, where the PaaS marketplace is, and definitely there's opportunity there, but is it billions of dollars for Red Hat? Can they monetize that? Uh, back to the OpenStack uh, even, Dave, you know, while Red Hat's doing a ton there, most companies are using, you know, in, in the development opportunities, they, they want free Linux. So you know they're using Ubuntu, they're using CentOS, which Red Hat bought. Um, you know, Red Hat is when it goes to production. Uh, so you know, how much does Red Hat contribute before they start reaping the benefits from the revenue? Wait, wait. Side? So we said they want free Linux. <laughs> Explain that. So um, they don't necessarily want to pay for all the wrapping support and everything like that because when I'm when I'm just developing it. I don't necessarily need the, the care feeding, you know, patch upgrades and things like that. I, I'm, I'm playing with it in a sandbox. Or can right? I get that from REL? So, so, um, so can I get that from Red Hat? Yeah, so, so absolutely, they have, they have Linux distributions, but am I going to pay Red Hat for uh, that subscription service uh, is, is the question I so had. Not whether or not Red Hat's going to be there. No, but can but I get the free version and not pay the subscription? Sure. So what's the difference? Why is, I mean, people talk about it, Ubuntu, I mean, somebody told me a couple years ago, Ubuntu was going to disrupt Red Hat. Red Hat keeps growing like crazy. Uh, but Canonical, we've had, you know, execs on. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, is there so, the, the, you know, I think we're going to dig into it uh, tomorrow probably with Jim. It was, it's a good case study in the book, actually, because there are customers that are using RHEL that aren't paying for the subscription. Um, so there, there's companies that are using other Linuxes that they try to get onto them, customers that are using it you know, kind of for free, and will run into environments where they want support, they, they, they need to, uh, you know, move to uh, reasons why they would have it, or there's customers that paid for it before that let it lapse. And, you know, we, we all have, you know, understand the subscription models as to how those work. Um, you know, Red Hat has to prove as a subscription model, you know, why they have value, why the customers want that. Um, they've got a pretty good renewal rate. They, as you said, they're growing at a, at a sizable clip, and that subscription is, you know, the main thing that they're doing. Uh, I mean, Dave, Dave, you've ta told me many times, you know, subscription is, you know, it's that new client acquisition and that growth uh, of what you're doing, and then expanding where they can add products onto it, things like cloud forms, uh, OpenShift, and, and, and other pieces that they're Well, I think it's a business, Red Hat, can get huge operating leverage because if you look at the financials, their renewal rate on a rev from a revenue standpoint is over 100%. So they're able to cross-sell, when they renew, they're cross-selling new PaaS services into their, their Red Hat Enterprise Linux subscription base and the average price is going up. So they're able to renew at a higher than 100% renewal rate, if you make sense what I'm saying, right? So. And their gross margins are, are, are very, very high. Their software-like gross margins, notwithstanding they have some training. And you know, their service, their training is like any services gross margin, 30%. But, but their subscription gross margins are software-like gross margins. So this company, as it adds new services, you know, can can be very, very profitable. The challenge for Red Hat, of course, is TAM, and that's why the cloud. That's why they love OpenStack. That's why the PaaS announcements. That's why they're acquiring companies like. Like, like Gluster and, and going hard into new areas like storage because they need to expand their TAM as you get a big, to be a bigger public company, people want more, you got to feed that beast. The TAM is pretty big, you know, it's, it's a very, very large opportunity for them. So the big question I have, Stu, is it coming off the sort of, you got Oracle, Docker, and Red Hat Summit this week, so coming off of Oracle, the story is end to end, from silicon all the way up to the app. We're going to give you the full stack, fully integrated. It's going to run better. It's going to be more reliable. It's going to be faster. It's going to be you know, more compliant, better security. And logically, that makes a lot of sense. But we heard from Dittmer that the open source community is going to be able to replicate that capability. Um, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. I think for someone like Amadeus, who seems to be you know, very much focused on open source, I think that they, they are going to be 
you know, can make it a requirement. You know, we've done surveys that show about 15 to 20 percent of the people say we've got to have open, open source, sort of open stack type of uh, of environment. Others, the, the 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 big chunk, will say, you know, maybe what 50 percent will say we're willing to trade uh, uh, the threat of lock-in for integration and function and reliability and comfort. And then there's a bunch that aren't sure. Well, those undecideds you know, could sway into the open source camp, and that's obviously good news. I think that's what's going to happen. I think the, the pro proportion of organizations that are going to rely on and ultimately insist on open source is going to increase dramatically. That, to me, portends well for the integration story. It's still going to be harder to get that level of integration from the open source community for some time. Uh, but, but really, that's the advantage that that these guys have is that ability to leverage the community. Yeah. So, 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 Dave, just to comment on that, I mean, the the, the architectural discussion I've had for most of my career in IT is, you know, do you build it in hardware or do you let software take over? And over the long haul, software always wins because you've got the power of Moore's Law there, and even if you can get a, a, a temporary advantage from hardware, um, th that hardware you know, will be caught up because, because of what Moore's Law can take over. I think in many ways, if you talk about open source, you know, if I've got the network effect of community and I have you know, hundreds, thousands, or millions of people uh, contributing to that effort, um, you know, it can do much more than what can be done inside any single organization. Um, you know, I, I spent a bunch of time at innovation events, you know, a student of it and, and, and believe in it, and we all know that there are many more smart people out there, uh, you know, than just what you have inside your organization. If you can tap into that, that is hugely powerful. That is the wave of open source. You know, I'm a believer, uh, and, you know, most of the people here at this conference, you know, understand long term that's where it's going, and, and absolutely that's where, you know, you know, most of the innovation is happening, and even the companies that are building the whole stacks, boy, they're baking in a lot of components that they get from the open source community. Uh, you talk about companies, you know, Google was built on open source, you know, Amazon leverages a ton of open source. Uh, they might not be, you know, in, in many ways, they're, they're so different from Red Hat, who contributes back 100% of what they do, but everyone is reaping the benefit from open source, and, uh, you know, that, that's part of the, you know, huge benefit of it. Yeah, and then the other interesting, I think, sort of storyline here is we're seeing, and we, we heard this uh, uh, this morning, we're seeing that, you know, seven, eight years on, what happened in the hyperscale world hits the enterprise. Question one, is that cycle compressing? As you get all these enterprise companies trying to replicate what Amazon, Google, and Facebook, and Microsoft are doing, will that cycle compress, number one? Number two is everybody's making the assumption that, you know, hardware doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> and I don't agree. I, I agree with 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 Tom Rosamilia. Infrastructure does matter. The infrastructure you don't, we don't we don't want to see it, um, but the plumbing matters, and it's going to affect performance. It's going to affect reliability, availability, recoverability, and so I you know we know Stu that the hyperscale guys are doing a lot of custom stuff in hardware. Meanwhile, the the enterprise is rotating to so-called commodity hardware. I can almost guarantee it's going to come back. Yeah, you're going to see more and, specialization. And, and, and Dave, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time batting this one back and forth because a lot of it, it's it's integration and leveraging. Um, you know, commodity is a bad word because standardized components. Uh, even Amazon, uh, you know, my, my take on it is they hyper hyper optimize their configuration. Sure, they've got two guys that spend, you know. They're every waking hour trying to you know tweak a power supply to get you know an extra one percent power efficiency or save a couple of cents off it because they can get millions of dollars of savings uh, if they can do that at the scale they are. But you know they're not creating uh, you know their own processors. They're taking you know standard networking chips, standard compute chips. Uh, building it into an environment that works in their data centers um, rather than a general purpose uh, in, in environment because that, that's the challenge we have today is, you know, if I'm a server manufacturer, you know, it might need to sit in a pretty cold data center or a pretty hot data center um, and data centers around the world it also for different sorts of voltage as opposed to Amazon can say, I'm going to buy something, I'm going to build, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 nodes of it and I only have to build it for one environment and therefore they, they can have much tighter requirements. So, I mean, 
Dave, I, I'm a hardware guy by training, so absolutely, I, I think it does matter at some point, especially that integration point uh, that we have. So. Um, I, I think it can be done through, through testing, um, through you know well-defined interfaces, um, and you know that that, that pull of open is going to be hard to fight. Well, and but the 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 model is how you control, deploy, you know, provision and manage that infrastructure, and that that will be done, is being done, must be done through code, uh, and then the next wave, as Furrier always talks about, is you know data. As, as the code, and so will the data prescribe you know, what workload, what app, what gets put where in, in, in a hu truly heuristic model? Um, that's always been the holy grail of IT. It's really the only way you're going to cut labor out of the IT. And we're seeing that with converged infrastructure. It's sort of the beginnings of all this. That's just going to accelerate. So, um, but so back to Red Hat, Stu, uh, good event. What, roughly 5,000 people here. Yes. A um, lot of developers, a lot of people in the partner ecosystem, uh, great keynotes, uh, all Red Hat and partner, right? No outside guys, no Condi Rice, no like big names, no Bill Clinton, is that right? Yeah, no, no, right. no. It's, uh, so it's, you, it's, you, you, you got, got to have somebody with the open source ethos to uh, reminds me of, uh, well, kind of reminds me of, of reInvent in a way, a lot of good, Amazon content, yeah, all the good both, customer content. I mean, You're Dave, the same here. you know, probably the top two developer-friendly shows that I've been to. Yeah, yeah, that's a compliment. If you look like reInvent, you're stoked. <laughs> all, right. all right, I think it's a wrap, Stu. We'll be back tomorrow. We we kick off the keynotes at 8:30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Stu and I will be back on it uh, a little after 10 o'clock with our kickoff of day two. This is the Cube. We're live from the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. This is Red Hat Summit. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.